This land is your land. Woody! Hey, Pete, it's so nice to see you again. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Woody, how you been? Well, I just can't believe how you blew up. I mean, you've come a really long way from the Almanac series. I remember those days. It was 1938. Freshly dropped out of Harvard, I went around my great big nation just looking for some songs to play. I thought I was such a whiz at the banjo and guitar, but then I met a man named Leadbelly. He was really big in the blues and folk, and his prowess showed me my place. I learned a lot from him, especially his song Goodnight Irene, which landed me a hit later on. Well, then you met me, and pretty soon we had the Almanac singers going. Ah, oh, the good old days. Some young folk today might think we were crazy, but we just pounded out one union song after another. Come to think of it, you and I were communists for a while. Wasn't everybody? Yes, but we went to more than one meeting. I still like the part where they told me, Mr. Pete Seeger, the communist, to tour around the South Pacific playing for our troops. I guess it's because they liked our renditions of traditional folk songs. That's how you became so big. After the war, you made a little group called the Weavers, and your retelling of our friend Ned Belly's Good Night Irene sold two million copies. Yep, we also had some other hits with Tsina Tsina, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine, and On Top of Old Smoking. Some success. You guys were the biggest folk act in the country. Regardless, Woody, McCarthy and his goons at QX still found out with my ties to the Communist Party, and pretty soon I was blacklisted. The Weavers had to disband, and I was called before the House on American Activities Committee. But I did not answer my political views. You didn't cite the Fifth Amendment like others did? I cited the First Amendment, Woody, which guarantees me the rights to a free association and free speech. I guess that's why you were found guilty of multiple charges of contempt of Congress. You're lucky the Court of Appeals saw your side. Even so, Woody, I was still blacklisted, but I didn't let that keep me down. I was still active in folk music and even covered the song Little Boxes. Which was one of the most satirical songs at the time about Levittown. I remember that song. Alvina Reynolds wrote it about that town on Long Island. Levittown was the first place where the greedy businessmen thought they could just mass produce houses. The construction crews only put together pre made building materials. Each crew was signed to a step. William J. Levitt and his cronies could pump out a house every 11 minutes. But gosh, I do remember that these Levittowns were so successful that many others popped up in other states, including New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Pretty soon, communities like these were found all around the country. I remember that this came out because of World War II. Really? Yes. After the war, the troops returned home, and the government realized that it was short on houses. The GI Bill, which was issued in 1944, allowed these veterans to purchase homes without down payments, instead borrowing all the money uh, needed to pay for the housing and paying it back in installments. It was a great idea to provide housing because then it seemed every person could claim the piece of the American dream. However, beloved town were all about conformity. Yeah, Woody, it's just like the song. Oh, just the same. Other than a few exterior differences, every house in Leffitt Town was identical, the same size, layout, and furnishings. The people also tried to be identical, because, e because each person tried to keep a neat lawn and have all the same appliances as the neighbors. The goal, my friend, was to not break the mold. The schools trained the children to look for jobs with big corporations. And these corporations all wanted their employees to wear the same clothing and act in similar ways. When these businessmen became successful and owned homes in these suburbs, they fed their children back into the same schools that stressed the need to conform to the corporate world. It is just like the song, because the sons end up in the same businesses as their fathers, and it's all one vicious cycle that goes from generation to generation. There's a sociologist named C. Wright Mills who, defined, who described this, and he said, then when white-collared people get jobs, they sell not only their time and their energy, but their personalities as well. And in addition to this conformity, these Levittowns embodied the racism of the 1950s. Because Mr. Levitt refused to sell any of his cute little American dream homes to African Americans, thus creating racially homogenous communities that exist to this day, Woody. Is that right? It is. Well, you were one of the few to speak up about it, so you did your part. Hey, I only wanted to play good music. The great folk music that I know and love and that could I could use to peacefully protest. Apparently many others liked what you did, because soon after McCarthy shut his mouth, some of the young people started playing your songs. Yep, it all started with Peter Paul and Mary's cover of my song, If I Had a Hammer. And soon after, I played and helped to organize the Newport Folk Festival in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And then the birds covered my song, Turn, Turn, Turn. And since the young folk musicians of this time and I had very similar political views, 
We often march together to support similar causes, such as civil rights for African Americans. I also played protest songs against the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. You were the connection between our protest songs and those of the 50s and 60s. Regardless of any lousy blacklist, you still succeeded in linking the folk of our generation to that of an equally angry generation. Later on, you've consistently asserted your belief that music is an instrument for social and political change. However resolute you are in your philosophy, you have proven true to your ideals. This very determination helped you inspire workers to unionize, bring folk music to the forefront of American culture multiple times, and stand for your beliefs on war and civil rights without fear. Your presence has left an undeniable mark on American history as the voice of many underrepresented individuals against those who would rather step on their rights. Well, I know, man. I was just playing my banjo and guitar. I only wanted to play the best music for my audiences, hoping and nudging them to sing along with me. You believe anyone, anybody can and should sing? I do. As a result, you insist that every one of your concerts that the audience sings along. It became your staple and your secret weapon whenever you played. Your attitude towards music has also been associated with your advocacy of your many causes. As the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame says, indeed Seeger's gently assertive insistence that his audience sing out can be read as a larger metaphor for the necessary involvement of citizens to ensure the healthy functioning of democracy in America. I'm gonna be a little bit extreme, okay? You've earned it. And now as I go back to my fight against the fascists, I will leave you to your fight against hatred everywhere. So long, Woody. Until the next time, Pete.